false doctrine, heresy, and schism, from hardness of heart and contempt of thy word and of handling, Lord, deliver us from light and tempest, from earthquake, fire, and flood, from plague, pestilence, and famine.
Genesis. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may eat freely of every tree in the garden, but the tree of knowledge and of good and of evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you will die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God say that you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of all the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. As sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgressions of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But as the free gift is not like the trespass, for many have died through one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The word of the Lord. The continuation of the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ.
at that time after Jesus was baptized. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Hmm. Oh, thought I lost page one. The first Sunday in Lent is Temptation Sunday. We always begin the Lenten season with some version of the temptation of Jesus by Satan following Jesus' baptism. And this morning, we have the version from Matthew's Gospel. This year, the temptation of Jesus is paired with the story of Adam and Eve and their problems in the garden. Then, in stark contrast to the story of the Garden of Eden, we have the temptation of Jesus, where Jesus is driven from his baptism into the wilderness, which is probably about as far from paradise, from the garden, as you can get. And there, unlike Adam and Eve, who are surrounded by ease and plenty, Jesus is exhausted and starving and alone as he struggles in his time of temptation and challenge. On the face of it, these two stories provide an obvious contrast. Adam and Eve are faced with temptation, and they sin. Jesus is faced with temptation, and he prevails against Satan. Adam and Eve, bad. Jesus, good. The moral of the story is, be like Jesus, don't be like Adam and Eve. What more needs to be said? Let's all go home, right? But on the surface, it's true We should strive to be like Jesus. Our faith calls us to do that. The only problem is, Jesus was God, and we're not. And that means we have to dig a little deeper into this story. The power of the story of Adam and Eve is not that it just describes accurately something that happened in the Bible a long, long time ago. What makes the story of Adam and Eve still powerful and still relevant is that it describes exactly what life is like in the here and now, in Milwaukee, in 2023. 
It tells the truth not just about Adam and Eve and what happened in the Garden of Eden. It tells the truth about us and our life and the things that we face. Over and over we find ourselves, just like them, tempted, forced to decide what to do with something which, on one hand, might look really good, might be useful, it might be fun. But on the other hand, in our hearts, we know that is not what God thinks is best for us. But we do it anyway. When faced with a legal or an ethical or a moral dilemma, we have to choose. We have to make that choice that is informed by how we have prepared ourselves for that moment. We have to make that choice, and how we do it depends on the moral foundation that we have chosen to build our lives on. In our Old Testament lesson for today, we find the first test for free will in the Garden of Eden. People, human beings, have an incredible propensity for self-rationalization. We are able to find meanings to do anything that we want to know, even what we want to do, even though we know it's not exactly right. And sometimes there is a kernel of right reasoning at its base, kind of like the character Jean Valjean in Les Mis, who steals bread to feed his sister's hungry family. Wrong thing, right reason, moral and ethical conflict. However, the Garden of Eden is paradise, and it has only two human occupants, and they have everything that they need, all the excuses are gone. They don't need to shop for food. They don't need clothes because they don't even know they're naked. None of the animals will harm them. And Adam and Eve were created as perfect companions for each other. The Hebrew describes Eve as Adam's equal, corresponding to him. And the King James Version translates the word from Hebrew into the word help me that many of us have heard growing up. Help me, meaning a helper who is equivalent. God, God even walks with Adam and Eve in the garden. What more could they need? Well, into this perfect situation comes choice. In the middle of the garden is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve tells us that it's a nice-looking tree with very tasty-looking fruit. On one level, the only choice in Eden was to decide whether to avoid eating from that tree or not. But if we dig deeper, if we look at it more closely, the real choice in the Garden of Eden was to decide whether they trusted God or if they didn't. The interaction between Eve and the snake I find fascinating. First off, it's a snake, and it's talking. And that might have been a red flag if they were paying attention. So Eve tells this talking snake that they could eat of any tree in the garden but one. And Eve even explains the prohibition. Eve says that not only can they not eat of the tree, they can't even touch it because in Eve's own words, They can't even touch the tree or they'll die. The snake, the talking snake, goes on to tell Eve they won't die. By the way, the snake is right. In fact, the snake is very truthful throughout this whole whole interaction. The snake is right in telling her what will happen. They will come to know the difference between good and evil. Eating from the tree will make them like God. And this is affirmed if we keep reading further into Genesis, into the story. The snake uses a kernel of truth to lure Eve into checking out the fruit, much like Satan 
will quote scripture to Jesus in the gospel reading for today to try to kick Jesus into sin. So Eve gets a nice piece of fruit and examines it closely and smells it and finds that it's really pretty, it smells good, and knowing that it can make her wise, she takes the fruit and she eats it. Then Eve gives some of it to her husband. And this is really an important note. This is something that I got hung up with this week that kept going around and around in my head. And it was even amplified this morning when I heard the epistle read this morning and something else flew, flew through my mind and I just x out the end of the sermon. <laughs> Think about this. Eve does not track down Adam to bring him up to speed on everything. Adam is there the whole time, standing right there, listening to this conversation, listening to what's going on, seeing the trap that his wife is being lured into. He knew exactly what was going on. He heard it all. Throughout history, this story has been twisted around to explain how women really screwed up everything from the beginning. The truth is, and we saw that, we see it in art, we see it in music, we see it all over the place, right? Adam, Eve standing there with the fruit all by herself. And we get in, in the narrative in our head, sometimes we think that Adam is just off on the back 40, just <laughs> pecking around, and then she comes and brings him in. The truth is, Adam was in it together with Eve the whole time. And they chose together not to trust God. They chose together to eat of the fruit that God told them that would kill them. In this first historical test case of free will, Eve and her consenting husband, her silent husband, showed that giving everything, they, they had everything they could possibly need, that together they still chose to disobey. They chose not to trust God. And then by extension, all of us are given the opportunity every day to make right choices. All of us every day face the temptation to make bad choices. And unlike Adam and Eve, we already have the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. We know what is right and what's wrong. We know the whole rest of the story. We know that God loved us so much that he came into the world to try to fix the mess that happened in that garden. And with all that knowledge, with all these choices that we have, it boils down to one thing. Do we trust God or not? God warned us in the Ten Commandments, how to live. God warned us not, not to murder, not to steal, not to commit adultery. And God even says if we do these things, that calamity will occur, will die. If not in body, we will in spirit. So the question for today is do we trust God or don't we? Because if we trust God, we'll try to keep his commandments. And if we don't trust God, we will ignore them, and we will reap the effects of the things that are heaped down on us for making wrong choices. As we go through life, every day, we confront the tree of good and evil. Now, like other trees in the forest, the tree of good and evil comes in many varieties. Varieties that can look tasty, that can offer a degree of nourishment, that can offer a degree of comfort or even joy, but once consumed, can lead to illness or death, spiritual illness or spiritual death. And we know what those are. We know what they look. We know what they're called. But Satan is tricky and sometimes wraps them up in different sort of package. The seven deadly sins: pride, greed, envy. Lust, gluttony, anger. And the one that really struck me as so I prepared for today was the original sin 
of Adam and Eve, and that was indifference. The seven deadly sins are often disguised as shiny and tasty delicacies, and there's a kernel of truth to them. But as soon as we take a bite and really delve into it, it tastes rancid, it tastes nasty. One other important takeaway from this story is that even in our wrong choices, God will not abandon us. The grace in Eden that was there, even when Adam and Eve did the one thing that God told them not to do, God still cared for them and watched over them. Just as when we sin, God watches us and cares for us. And at the same time, hopefully, through repentance and through forgiveness, God offers us a chance to make a right choice the next time around. Now usually at this point in the sermon I say, as we go out into the world today, this is what we need to worry about. And I could have thrown out the Lenten things, yeah, as we go out into the world today, let's pray, let's fast, a little absence, self, self-denial. Yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. We know all that, right? We know all that. But if we get back into the story for today, I think what we need to do when we go out into the world is not to be indifferent, not to be silent in the face of all the evil things that we confront, not to be silent in the face of racism and bigotry, not to be silent in the face of homophobia. Not to be silent in the face of a society where almost 60% of the people are becoming are illiterate. Almost 60% of the people in Milwaukee can't read to navigate through life. I think that the church, what we're being called to do in this time, in this place, is not to be indifferent to the plight of people that we encounter every day in our lives. And we do encounter them, and sometimes we just choose to pull down the visor or put on our shades and drive right past them, to drive up North Avenue right through town, to drive down and get on the freeway, even though there's a guy sitting there holding, I need, I need some money, right? The original sin of Adam and Eve, at least in my reading of it this time, was indifference. And so as we go out into the world this week, my prayer is that we can examine our lives, we can examine the moral and ethical foundation that we make our decisions based upon. And in the face of evil, in the face of whatever our sphere of influence is, our families, our community, our church, whatever, to stand up and rail against evil. Because look what happened when Adam and Eve didn't. The world went in a funny way. And we have a chance to remedy that. And that's what St. Paul was talking about in the gospel for today, in the epistle for today. And it really hit me at 8 o'clock. For just as one man's disobedience, though many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And that's us, my brothers and sisters. We are that one man. In our time and in our place, we're the image and likeness of God reflecting back into the world, and so we become that one man. So that through our actions, through not being indifferent to what's going on in the world around us, we can go out and we can make a difference. Let us stand and profess our common faith using the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 7 in the Order for Service. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternal God and the Father, God from God. Light from light, true God from true God, the
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to All Saints on this first Sunday in Advent. Um, as is our custom, we have this service with the Great Day, which was actually, in pre-Reformation times, the first service actually translated from Latin into English, and it's been added to over the years. And I would encourage you to take the bulletin home and to stash it away somewhere, because it is a beautiful, awesome prayer. And what it does it gives us the ability to pray we don't know what to say. Sometimes the world just leaves us speechless. And so I think that's the power of the litany. When we find ourselves speechless in the face of what gets tossed at us on time, just pull it out and pray it because it covers just about everything from start to finish. Welcome to our visitors and guests. And we remind you that in the Episcopal Church, all baptized Christians are welcome to receive Holy Communion. And please join us for coffee or following the service through those doors and down the hall. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice for us.
the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is Always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, he was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace we are able to triumph, over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone but for him who died for us and rose again therefore we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Become subject to evil and death. You and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. In the night he was handed over to suffering and death. Our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body that is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our Redemptional Father in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. 
All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. 
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down before the Lord. Grant, Almighty God, that your people may recognize their weakness and put their whole trust in your strength so that they may rejoice forever in the protection of your loving providence through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.